We bought the house about two years ago, hoping that we would be able to retire here. But from here, you could see how much sand we've lost underneath the house. The world is running out of sand, consumed by industry and construction, stolen and transported by criminal mafias around the world. Washed away by rising sea levels. We have been in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the last 5,000 years. We can't just die. Lost to human greed and stupidity. When we lose that sand, that means we lose our life. We've never needed so much sand so badly. But with beaches and entire islands already disappearing, who will win the sand wars? For most of us, sand makes us think of days at the beach, sandcastles, and sunshine. And once the holidays are over, we slip back into our busy lives. But is feeling the sand between our toes or caught in our bathing suits the whole story? Does this so familiar substance play any other role in our daily lives? Sand is what I like to call an unsung hero of our lives because there are just endless examples of the way in which sand intersects with our daily lives, which we are really not commonly aware of. Sand has quietly infiltrated every corner of our world. Melted and transformed into glass, it sits on every shelf. It's also the source of silicon dioxide, a mineral found in our wines, cleaning products, detergents, paper, dehydrated foods, hairspray, toothpaste, cosmetics, and an astounding variety of other products we use every day. But it's also a source of strategic minerals, such as silica, thorium, titanium, uranium. Think about your computers, your electronics. No electronic chips can be manufactured if you do not have high quality sand. The minerals extracted from sand are at the core of our hyper-connected society. They form a basic material for microchips, without which our computers, credit cards, bank machines, cell phones, and many other devices would not exist. Sand even helps us fly. In our airplanes, the plastics, lightweight alloys of the fuselage and jet engines, even the paint and tires are all made with sand. It's almost become like air, the air we breathe. We don't think too much about it but you can't live without it. And the industry with the biggest appetite for sand? Construction. For the last 150 years, sand mixed with cement to form concrete has shaped the contours of our increasingly urbanized world. Because of its low cost, strength, and ease of use, this gray slurry has become the dominant building material around the globe. The quantities used are astronomical. To build an average house, it takes 200 tons of sand. For a larger building like a hospital, around 3,000 tons. Each kilometer of highway devours 30,000 tons. And to build a nuclear plant, the estimate is about 12 million tons. Global production of sand exceeds 15 billion tons per year. And that is a quantity that is so huge that is beyond imagination. How much is 15 billion tons per year? You don't know. Because no other resource is used in such vast quantities as sand, maybe with the exception of water. So where in the world does that much sand come from? Let's just say the sandmen who work in the aggregate business have not been affected by the economic downturn.
behind air and water, sand is the most used commodity in the world. Business is booming, but meeting this demand is not always an easy task. Sand is not something that's easily found like you might think it is. It used to be that you'd have a sand and gravel deposit and you'd simply go and dig it up out of the ground so you'd have sand to make your roads, bridges, and buildings out of. But that type of material has all been taken away. It's gone. We've used it already. With deposits of surface sand exhausted, we started dredging rivers for sand. But this has led to flooding. Now we've turned to the oceans for sand. To satisfy our seemingly insatiable appetite for sand, we've industrialized extracting it from beneath the waves. And the workhorse of the industry is a dredger, a giant tanker equipped with a suction arm capable of pumping huge quantities of sand to the surface. The right vessel in the right location can pump up to 400,000 cubic meters of sand to the surface every single day. Each dredger costs anywhere from $25 million to $200 million. But the sand is free. So the thousands of tankers combing the world's oceans have every incentive to suck up as much sand as possible for their increasingly hungry clients. Dubai is an astonishing example of this appetite. Within a few decades, this fishing village has morphed into a mecca of modern architecture. It's a sandbox for developers where no fantasy is too grandiose. But Dubai's ambitious projects swallow up a lot of sand. We're using huge volumes of sand in construction projects, concrete, and indeed just, just making more land, as, as Dubai has been doing with the, with the artificially constructed islands. Dubai's landfills are even bigger consumers of sand than concrete. With a booming economy, the Emirate launched an ambitious expansion project, the Palm. After the year 2000, with the price of real estate soaring as a result of speculation, developers bet that it would be cheaper to make land than to buy it. The self-proclaimed eighth wonder of the world cost over $12 billion and devoured more than 150 million tons of sand dredged from Dubai's coastline. With the giant palm still under construction, Dubai, flying high on the seemingly endless supply of money and sand, embarked on an even more extravagant project, the world. The world is an island paradise where unprecedented opportunity can be found that is almost as rare This artificial as archipelago ocean, of 300 islands designed as a map of the world absorbed $14 billion and three times as much sand as the palm. The world, a place beyond imagination. Today, the world is a mirage. The worksite has been abandoned since the onset of the financial crisis in 2008. Deserted islands now parched in the sun, awaiting the uncertain day when millionaire buyers will again descend on Dubai and restore its glory. For Nikhil, the corporation managing the palm in the world, the crisis is more than financial. Overdevelopment has totally liquidated Dubai's natural sand resources. And you think, well, fine, of course, Dubai is on the edge of the desert. They've got all the sand they need. Like all the Gulf states, Dubai has sand everywhere. So why doesn't the emirate simply help itself to the desert? Desert sand is the wrong kind of sand for building artificial islands. Why? Because desert sand, all the grains have been blown around by the wind and is typically very round and very smooth. If you want to use it to build an island, they don't stick together. You need sand that, that is more angular, you know, it's rougher, rougher edge sand that naturally sticks together. Sea sand is perfect for island building and construction, but it's in limited supply. Sand is not a sustainable resource. Although its own stocks are exhausted, Dubai is far from giving up.
Burj Khalifa. At the time of construction, the world's tallest building was built with sand from half a world away. We have a saying in English, which is selling sand to the Arabs, um, which is obviously a joke, but uh, it's, it seems that that's actually come true in the case of Dubai. 3,500 Australian companies export sand to the Arabian Peninsula. Their profits have tripled in 20 years, accounting for a $5 billion jackpot. And Australia is just one small part of a global trend. They're reliant on importing sand from other areas. Um, and so what we see is this huge trade around the world um, of sand moving from one area to another um, for different purposes, such as construction, land reclamation. Singapore is another city at the heart of the sand wars. In 30 years, the country known as the Switzerland of Asia has become one of the richest in the region. During this time, the population has more than doubled, and the 63 islands that make up this city-state are bursting at the seams. Singapore is reliant on the import of sand for, for its very existence. I mean, the land mass has literally increased 20% over the last 40 years, uh, and that's largely been reclamation, so literally pouring sand into the sea to create new land. Singapore has already transformed 130 square kilometers of water into land and is planning to add another 100 square kilometers by 2030. Having devoured all its own reserves, its voracious appetite has targeted its neighbor's supplies. One after another, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia have each decided to ban trade with Singapore, but its addiction to sand is not easy to restrain. Singapore is being accused of expanding its coastline with illegally dredged sand from neighboring states. Reclaiming more land has become a difficult task for this tiny island city-state. Well, at least legally. There are some accusations sand smuggling is making up this shortfall. Suspicions of sand trafficking hang over Singapore, and the dozens of barges filled to the brim which unload daily in its port prove that the city-state has found an alternative source. But where does this sand come from? How many tons here? Uh, just 3,000 tons. And you come here very, uh, every day? Every week? Uh, today, one trip. Today, one trip. Today, one trip. This one is from Indonesia also? No, Cambodia. Cambodia? Cambodia, here. Yeah, Cambodia. Cambodia? This one that uh, sounds sick then. Uh. Oh. And you Indonesia? Yeah. Uh. You work for Indonesian company or Singapore? Company? A Singapore company. Thanks to local trafficking networks, Singaporean dealers with false identities working for fictional companies continue to find supplies of sand in neighboring countries. <laughs> But this is not a company, no? This is the address, 60 Trust Street. Uh, we thought that in this address there was an investment of real estate and company. Oh, this is the Pilates place. Okay, thank you. Bye. They flaunt the law with the tacit support of the government, their most loyal client. He's, he's 32. 32, yes. Because I can only find number 30. Yeah. Could it be the address is wrong? The sand trade in Singapore is hugely hypocritical. It's a massive hypocrisy as far as we're concerned. Um, it's the state has built itself as a you know environmental leader in the region, particularly within ASEAN. They've held global summits, but their companies who are bringing imports for their country contribute to human rights violations, environmental degradation, um, and damage the livelihoods of local people. the effects of underwater dredging are far from benign. Much of the ocean floor is rocky or covered with only a thin layer of sand, built up over tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. As you dredge up the sand, uh, of course, all the, the animals and plants uh, that are on the sea floor, they will all be dredged up as well. And, and therefore, whatever living communities are there will, will just uh, be eliminated. Sand is the primary link in the underwater food chain. 
remove it, and the survival of all species, from the smallest to the largest, is threatened. Like many archipelagos, many of Indonesia's islands are literally made of sand, and intense dredging has triggered a series of chain reactions. Around 92% of Indonesian fish consumption come from traditional fishery. Because of mining activities, we lose coral reef, we lose fish, we lose livelihood of fishers, we lose everything. Loss of fish habitat directly endangers the survival of thousands of Indonesian families. But that's only the first of sand dredging's adverse effects. If you have an island made of sand, it's only there because of conspiracy of natural processes, wind, waves, water currents, time of year, and so on. If you start removing that sand, then you've upset the balance of that conspiracy, and waves and currents will then start to move the rest of the sand. After the extraction of sand, a combination of waves, currents, and gravity slowly fill in the vacuum. So the removal of underwater sand can have a very noticeable effect on nearby beaches and islands. And so by a combination of natural processes and human excavation, the island can literally disappear. One of the most stunning impacts of the sand trade was the disappearance of some of the islands off the coast of Indonesia, um, which have literally vanished. When we lose that sand, that means we lose our life. Once an island disappears, the international maritime boundary changes, or is required to. These become geopolitical issues, as, as well as simply commercial and, and uh, resource issues. 25 Indonesian islands have already disappeared. Like oil and gas, sand is now on the front line of the world's hunger for raw materials. Scarcity endangers local communities and sets governments against each other. As demand builds, the circle only becomes more vicious. Morocco's gentle climate has been welcoming tourists for years. But its famous beaches have also been attracting some strange four-legged visitors. A constant stream of men and donkeys descend on the beaches seven days a week in search of sand. The men and their donkeys have taken so much sand that some beaches now look like the surface of the moon. Morocco's been experiencing a construction boom, spurred on by a competitive real estate market. The builders are happy, but they need plenty of sand, legal and otherwise. <laughs> دابا انا كنهضر انا دابا كنهضر معاك وانا خايف خايف لان كل هراوة خايف لان قتلوني هاد الناس الله اللهم اللهم هذا منكر خسروا الطبيعة الطبيعة كانت بحال كويا ها قالك عيد هو السياج عيد هو عيد هو السياج وعيد هو هادي بزاف منكم هادشي هادشي معقول هادشي عندنا عرضة من الحشرة ما تقوم الا الموت قريبة كلك كلك حلو عليها الله ينصر الحق الله ينصر الحق it's estimated that 40 to 45 percent of the sand used in construction in Morocco has been stolen, mostly from its beaches. Loaded onto trucks, the sand is sold directly to unscrupulous developers. But that's not where the problem ends. Without proper treatment, salty beach sand mixed with cement is highly corrosive making Morocco's new buildings ticking time bombs, in danger of collapse. Ironically, the beaches meant to lure the tourists are being stripped bare to build hotels and condos that may turn out to be death traps.
in Mumbai, we enjoy uh, the position of being the financial capital of the country. And we are also have a huge housing boom, construction boom. That's because of the influx of so many new people into the city. With the Indian economy booming, construction has to keep pace. And like in so many other battlegrounds of the sand wars, easy profits lead to corrupt practices. The value of sand is such that it's a commercial commodity that is smuggled. I mean, the, 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 it's a big business, is smuggling sand. The Sand Mafia is the most powerful criminal organization in India. A lot of the people who, uh, who control the Sand Mafia also control a lot of the construction, the construction materials businesses in Bombay, as well as the constructions themselves. In addition to that, they also control the administration through their political contacts. So that just completes the whole value chain right from extraction to construction, the, the profits in each part of it, the administration and the police. Under the eyes of corrupt authorities, the sand pirates ply their trade in broad daylight at more than 8,000 dredging sites scattered across the coasts and riverbanks of the subcontinent. Mafias, beaches are easy prey because the sand is literally within arm's reach. So they hit even the most popular tourist sites, the places where you expect to stretch out on a beach and worship the sun. The tentacles of the Mafias, however, are just adding to the pressures facing the world's beaches. Globally, between 75 and 90 percent of beaches are actually undergoing some sort of retreat. And that's only going to get worse. Just two years ago, there was a row of houses here, uh, about, I think, about eight houses from about here all the way down to the condo. And those houses, they were underwater. The shoreline was going right past them. So they ended up taking them out. So these houses here, which are on the beachfront, were row number two. And I, I suspect that these houses won't be here in five years. We bought the house about two years ago, hoping that we would be able to retire here. But from here, you could see how much sand we've lost underneath the house because it was up to level with the cement, but of course it went out into the ocean. So. The beach area was about the length of a football field. And over the last two years, the escarpment is up underneath the houses. So, the erosion on this part of the beach is much quicker than we anticipate it or that is deemed normal. The beach extends all the way offshore down what we call the shore face to a depth of 30 or 40 feet. This is a, this is a surface on which sand goes back and forth and back and forth. I like to think the beaches are thinking things, that they, they, they're doing the smart thing. They're flattening out to protect themselves, to preserve themselves. So that's, that's, uh, that's smartness. As part of the natural cycle, beaches adjust to seasonal changes. In summer, beaches grow thicker. And in winter, they recede and level off to better absorb the energy of the waves. To survive the ocean's assault, beaches must have enough space behind them. But we build too close to the shore, so with nowhere to go, beaches are overcome by the waves, which carry their sand out to sea. Where humans have intervened and we've built structures, a wall, concrete, seawall, a, a highway, a hotel, a parking lot, the beach can't move back. And we see long-term beach loss. If you have an eroding beach, what is the problem? Not the symptom. The sim symptom is the beach is eroding. But what is the problem? What's causing that? It's us.
we are drawn to coastlines. Today, three quarters of the largest cities and half the world population are on the coast. As the population growth accelerates, the world's hyper-urbanized coastlines increase in density. By 2025, three quarters of the world's inhabitants will live near the ocean. And those thin ribbons of sand which surround the continents are feeling the pressure. Endangered species. I know. We're going to post it. We're going to post. Oh, no sand allowed. How expensive out. that is. If we think back, we should have never allowed these big buildings so close to the water. And I hope that we learn from that. But now we're here, we have this, and we have to figure out how to make projects to have a beach that is wider, and that's what brings tourists to Miami Beach. When you think about the economy of Florida, it thrives on beaches. When people think of Florida, they think of sandy beaches, and uh, you can't have sandy beaches without sand. In Florida, nine out of 10 beaches are in the process of disappearing, along with the future livelihood of all those who depend on this economic engine. We have progressively been losing a lot of sand, um, and it causes uh, you know, difficulties for us with our hotel guests and our residents because they have no place to really enjoy the beach. So obviously it's our livelihood. We, we depend on the beach to be able to maintain the hotel open. Each year, a third of the planet's tourists head for the beach. Beaches feed the hotel industry, as well as recreation, transportation, food services, and a multitude of other sectors. In some areas, almost half the GDP depends directly on beaches. Letting them disappear is out of the question. So what we're trying to do is try to mitigate those problems, try to lessen the impact, and that's why we have to take these unnatural acts of pumping sand into the beaches. To keep their beaches viable, cities that can afford it invest astronomical sums in beach replenishment therapy. A dredge pumps sand from the ocean floor and pours it onto the beach. Some people see this as a solution. Others see it as a band-aid which only treats the symptom. They dredge it and put it up the beach and say, this is beach nourishment, but it's just another hole. Those big machines, that when they go take this sand, they're in killing. Everything within that sand is ground up, put into a pipe, crushed, moved, and then it comes out and pumped on a beach. Well, the life forms in that part of the beach aren't prepared to be buried alive and suffocated. It's a killing process for the sake of dollars. Today, it's multi-billion dollars being spent just in the state alone. And guess what? They're not curing anything. Our problems are getting worse. If there's no sand there naturally, or the sand will not stay, why should it stay there? Because we took it out of a truck or a, of a ship. And we, we did a project like that in California. And most of the sand, this was a $17.5 million project, most of the sand was gone within a year. Coastal engineering community is a bankrupt profession in the sense that they they do they come up with the answers that the community wants to hear. Beach replenishment is a temporary remedy. After a year or two, the sand has been washed out to sea, and the whole process must be started again from scratch. Nonetheless, this method is highly popular, to the delight of the dredging companies. It's a matter of uh, big money big, big influence, greed. It's not a pleasant scene to see. You see this beautiful beach, but behind it is something that's not so pleasant. In a desperate maneuver to try to trap the sand on the beaches, coastal engineers are advocating the construction of dikes, breakwaters, and all sorts of other structures. But sand cannot be so easily tamed. The constant movement of sand is not necessarily always cooperating with the way we want the place to be. It will fill up our harbors, or it will wash away from beaches where we like tourists to come. And so that balance is, is something that we are automatically changing just by building a harbor, or by building a seawall around uh, that, that extends out from the beach. 
We build a wall to, to contain sand, to keep it on our beach. What do we do? We stop the sand from supplying our neighbor's beach. The tragedy is, is that people are just not aware. They are not aware that an action here is going to have a reaction somewhere else. So we all have to be very careful when it comes to redeveloping the coastline. We have a responsibility because we don't want these great, wonderful treasures that we want to share with our children to disappear because of greed, because of irresponsibility, and because of just not damn paying attention. All of our structures have impacts, and, and we cannot in the long run win. <laughs> so um, most structures, ultimately, anything we build is going to fail. In order to avert further catastrophe, it's important to understand the source of 90% of the world's sea sand, often a long way from the beaches. Most of the natural sand in Florida came down through the Carolinas and, and Georgia and probably perhaps even Virginia. You know, a lot of the major rivers and things like that that uh, drain from the Appalachian Mountains. So, you know, geologically, that's the source of this uh, salacious sand. For the most part, it starts in a rock somewhere that breaks down. It might be in a river from ice or snow or rainfall. And as that grain comes out of the granite or the sandstone, it gets into a small stream and then a larger river. And in a normal world, ultimately, it will work its way all the way to the shoreline. It takes thousands or even millions of years for a grain of sand to reach the sea. And it's a journey full of pitfalls. In America, we have been building one dam every day since the Declaration of Independence in 1776. One a day. 80,000 dams block the rivers of the United States. In China, where the demand for energy is exploding, dams are popping up everywhere, so that by 2020, not a single waterway will reach the sea. And in the rest of the world, there are at least 845,000 dams. And it's not only water they're holding back. So all that sand that should be at the beach is behind the dam. One quarter of the sand reserves of the planet are hostage to these dams. And the sand that makes it beyond the dams will run into another trap, river dredging. Although it's regulated in many countries, it's still a widespread practice, especially in countries where legislation is weak. The result? About 50% of the sand that should nourish the world's beaches will never reach the sea. coastline, like many other environments, uh, it's like the Earth. It was always thought so big, so vast, that we couldn't have an impact on it. We built a dam for water or electricity, which is a good thing, but downstream there's no more sand. So somehow we have to figure out how to bring all those things back into balance by taking some conscious steps to try to reduce the impacts of those things we're doing as a civilization. Grain after grain, beaches slowly erode, mute victims of decades of human interference. If you add the rising level of the ocean, you get an ecological time bomb. The sea rise, it's just going to happen a lot more quickly without sand. But it's not going to stop there. It's going to take out, you know, half of Manhattan. It's going to it's going to take our cities as well. It's going to keep coming. The sand is our barricade, and we have to understand that. 
In the middle of the Indian Ocean, sand is a matter of life and death. Sand divers have been collecting coral sand from the lagoons for years and selling it to developers. But with sea levels rising, this sand harvesting is leading to some serious problems. Sand is a very uh, precious commodity in the mountains because this one millimeter of the ocean touching you constantly every minute, every second, every day, every year is such a force and it can easily deform or erode an island. The Maldives are eroding at an alarming rate. Residents do what they can to protect their homes, but many beaches are little more than memories. Several hundred islands have already been evacuated. And today the refugees crowd onto larger and better protected islands, such as Malé, the capital. Already overcrowded, new houses are being crammed together. But in another bitter irony of the sand wars, new construction requires ever more sand. We have been in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the last 5,000 years. We have a written history that goes back 2,000 years. We can't just die. Far from the Maldives' beautiful, threatened beaches, greed and speculation drive the global markets for sand and show no signs of slowing down. The prices of houses are completely unaffordable already to most people. A lot of the uh, buildings and flats are held on speculation for investment. Some estimates say that more than 50% of the flats in Bombay are actually vacant, being held by builders for investment purposes. Prices shoot up, the common man's unable to afford houses. So when you continue to keep building because of development, it's not really going to people who really need it because the population in slums is growing exponentially. Bombay is not an isolated case. There's never been so much construction, but at the same time, housing has never been less affordable. One third of urban populations now live in slums, while ghost cities and empty apartments are being built all over the world. In China, 65 million flats are empty, yet the construction industry is flourishing, swallowing up one quarter of the sand extracted on the planet. Spain holds the unfortunate record as the European country most addicted to sand. In the midst of an unprecedented housing crisis, 30% of the homes constructed since 1996 sit empty. Entire airports have been built without seeing a single passenger. And in Dubai, the Emirate continues to build and import sand, even if 90% of the apartments in the Burj Khalifa are vacant. Once you've taken a bucket full of sand and you've put it into a concrete block to build a building, you've locked it away. That bucket of sand is no longer an available resource. There are components and behaviors physical behaviors and chemical and mineral components of sand that are far more valuable than just using up the sand in a, in a fundamental, uh, you know, just, just pouring it into concrete. But sadly, real estate speculation doesn't hold the monopoly on the wasting of sand. Governments are also to blame. Highway construction uses inexpensive sea sand. The strips of asphalt we built snaking around the world have swallowed up massive amounts of the world's beaches. Think about the number of roads that governments across the world have to build. It's the public sector who are the largest consumers of sand. 
had the sand wars even registered on our political leaders' radars. Access to energy in the developing world, on deforestation, on climate change, on the reform of the agricultural common policy, on the common fisheries policy, on land grab, on natural resources and on access to water. Without coherence... Very often you find that you need a problem to get a lot worse before it's going to get on the agenda. We talk about water because we know there's a major problem with that right now in Europe. And we have had the debate on that, we've had the policy, we're implementing a policy. On soil, we're still having the debate. Um, on sands, uh, we're not having the debate. It's very, very crucial that politicians, scientists, engineers come together and find alternatives for the most for the, for, for the use where it's used most, which is construction. Can we continue to build and at the same time free ourselves from this dependence on sand? Are other materials capable of replacing concrete? From the straw that's burned after the crop is done, you could build straw bale houses, which use no cement, except maybe the the slab on the floor, but, and they're earthquake proof. Those houses are perfectly insulated and they're fireproof. You don't have to build concrete buildings. You see this building right here? This building was built with 95% recycled materials. All the steel is recycled. It's made from Japanese cars, or, you know? It's all recycled steel. And when this building is finished, they can melt this steel down and make more buildings. There's so many materials which can be recycled. I think we need to exhaust those. And in the meantime, maybe the world changes. You know, some years ago, people used to build not with this quantity of uh, reinforced cement concrete, but at different methods of construction. Perhaps we'll find different methods of construction. But in the meantime, at least we need to use recycled materials as far as possible. Like straw and metal, our homes are recyclable, and rubble can be reused to build roads or new housing projects. But these solutions must face our usual inertia and relentless lobbying by the construction industry. Construction companies are equipped for and know how to work with concrete. So radically changing our construction practices is an uphill battle. What if there was another granular material that might substitute for sand? There's one very interesting beach north of San Francisco called Glass Beach. And it turns out that for years, um, the city dumped all of their trash onto the beach. The glass got broken up by the waves and got rounded. And today, this is this wonderful, sparkly, shiny, sort of a magical beach. It started out as a garbage dump. What nature has done at Glass Beach has inspired people to attempt a similar trick thousands of kilometers away in Florida. You can turn a liability, which is something that has to be disposed of and takes landfill space or something like that into an asset then you've killed two birds with one stone. I think everybody realized that glass is made out of sand. And if people started scratching their heads and say, well, maybe that's a good use of it to return it to sand. Glass bottles and packaging are everywhere. They are usually collected and recycled into new containers. But when it's crushed into fine pieces, that glass can be just like sand. Got all of the physical characteristics. It's as uncontaminated and pure as uh, regular beach sand. It, it not only looks like sand, but it behaves exactly like sand. So it is sand. I mean, there's, there's no reason to expect a difference. Sand from recycled glass is one promising alternative for the beaches of Florida and elsewhere. On the beaches where it has been tested, even the sea turtles have adopted it as a place to lay their eggs. As much as one quarter of the glass that we throw away is not recycled and ends up in the dump. Crushed, it could be a perfect component in the making of concrete. But compared to natural sand, this sand is still too expensive. 
when sand begins to cost higher, maybe other sources can compete with it. Other alternatives can compete with it. Right now, there is no competition. You cannot compete with something that is already at rock bottom uh, pricing. As sand alternatives and new construction methods struggle to gain legitimacy, the sand gold rush is gaining speed and more battle fronts are appearing. On the coast of Brittany, hundreds of families survive by traditional fishing. But today, the fishermen are angry. A multinational with a thirst for sand plans to exploit the ocean floor, destroying their livelihoods. On n'a pas le droit ni de dragage ni chalutage, donc on n'a pas le droit de passer de râteau si on veut quoi. Et là, à ce moment-là, eux ils viendraient au bulldozer quoi. Ça, grosso modo, c'est ça quoi. Alors, euh, de quel droit on peut faire ça quoi De quel droit Euh, là, c'est une société qui va enlever du sable pour faire des gros bénéfices. Ça, bon, euh, si, si, encore, si c'est pas impactant sur, euh, sur notre boulot ou l'environnement, pourquoi pas euh, Moi, je sais qu'ils fassent du bénéfice, que c'est très bien. Mais là, ça gêne tout le monde. On n'en veut pas. Les entreprises ont venu à Brussels pour parler des règles de Natura 2000, rules, disant que nous ne pouvons pas, sous ces règles, aller aux choses que nous avons besoin. Donc, ce qu'ils ont essayé de démontrer, c'est que by doing it, by taking out sand from the Natura area, there is no impact. On parle d'une énorme dune sous-marine sur laquelle on travaille en fait régulièrement puisque c'est là qu'on trouve à, à, à coup sûr à du coup poisson, sûr. Voilà. même s'il fait mauvais. Ce qui nous permet de dire que c'est vraiment un, une, un, un habitat, bien sûr, mais un endroit refuge. C'est précisément cette dune qu'ils veulent nous prendre. Il ne faut, faut pas faire des choses comme ça. Au nom de quoi nous enlève-t-on ce sable Ce sable n'appartient à personne. Nous l'avons reçu en partage de ceux qui nous ont précédés et nous devons le rendre à ceux qui vont nous suivre. The exasperation of the Brittany fishermen has shaken up the elected officials and the citizens, inspiring them to mobilize against the seizure of their sand. Je ne sais pas si on gagnera. En tout cas, on a le devoir de combattre. Perhaps grassroots movements such as this will mobilize other groups around the world to stop the sand wars. Once people know, once people understand what the issue is and how important it is, whether it's each grain of sand on that beach or the importance of, of that beach and their community to their lives and their community, I think there's hope. See, see for yourself. This is the sand used for construction. This sand has been taken from where? From the beaches. So as much as they take this sand, the soil erosion will be more, and this will have a very serious impact on our island. Are you sad? Yes. So it's the time to do something, right? Yeah. We have to do something. Yes. Will you give this information to your parents? Yes. Will you give this information to those people whom they are construct making construction places over there? Yes. Will you pass this information uh, to the people whom they take sand from this place? Yes. Go to the beaches, enjoy the beaches, learn about the beaches, and then do something about it. Let's not let the beaches disappear. I believe that the younger generations um, of the planet must come out and try to impress upon others the gravity of the issue and what is happening to the planet and rescue it. We must save the beaches. Given the scale on which our, our society is built with sand, I think sand deserves a little more respect. Whether it's more freeways, whether it's more dams, 
We got to get away from these gigantic schemes and get back to a simpler way of living. There have been tremendous environmental victories, but the beach itself, it's been left to fight for itself. Maybe it needs us to fight for it. The fate of the world's beaches is not cast in concrete. Perhaps the day will come when we'll see sand with fresh eyes. Conscious of how every grain plays a role in the health of our planet and in our lives. Then by working with nature instead of against her, we can win the sand wars for the good of us all.